God is consistent where we are inconsistent. He is love for us where we are hate for ourselves. He is kindness where we are unkindness. God's mercy is consistent and will bring us home every time. And this, I love this passage from Hebrews 2. And it reads this, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In that short passage, it shows us how various God's mercy is for us. He frees us from the devil and the power of death. He frees us from slavery and fear. He frees us from our own sin, the times when we've made mistakes, when we've gone wrong. And he frees us from our ignorance. He shows us a better way to live. And this is why God's mercy is so wider than we often realize, so much more varied than we can often ever understand. And this God who is so merciful to us, if you remember back to that Genesis passage, we're supposed to reflect him. We're supposed to be in his image and likeness. And yet God has to consistently reach down to save us. It shows us how far we have fallen from being in the image and likeness of God. And yet, as Paul goes on to explain, he is transforming us slowly and surely to reflect him more. But it's important as we carry on with this uh, preach and this passage, it's important to have God's mercy on our mind. That we, ha we have that in the back of our mind when we approach these next few verses, that actually God is merciful to us. He wants to save us. He wants to look after us from our own sin. He wants to reach down and bring us to him. And Paul goes on to respond how we might Paul goes on to say, sorry, how we might respond to this mercy. He says, we offer our bodies as living and holy sacrifices. What a challenge. Now, this passage is one of my favorite passages because it challenges me. It challenges me to consider God's mercy, but also how often can I call my life a holy and pleasing sacrifice? How often does my life reflect this call of embodying holiness. You know, in the church at the moment, in the present day church, we look back over history and we think that holiness is almost this dirty word because we strive to argue that actually it is by faith and not by works that grace is achieved. And this is true, you know, we are saved by grace. But whether we like it or not, we are called as Christians to be holy. In 1 Peter 1.15, it says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. There's no getting around this. We are called to be holy. We are called to be pleasing sacrifices to the Lord. And how do we do this? By acting in a way that honors God, by following scripture, by living in a way that reflects the holiness of Jesus. It says in the Bible, whoever has my commands and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. We love God by living in this holiness. And Paul goes on to say that actually this is our true and proper worship. One of the struggles for me over this time of lockdown has been missing times of extended sung worship. Although I'm probably not the best singer, I find it as a really enjoyable time uh, to just encounter God. I find worship really uplifting. 
But for Paul, although there's evidence that in the early church there was singing, that's not true and proper worship. True and proper worship is what we do with our lives in the everyday. And so even though I look forward to the day where we can sing together again, it is not the worship I should be pursuing. The worship I should be pursuing is making my life, my choices, my actions, pleasing and holy to God, so that I might be a living sacrifice. So on that last day, I can hear those words that the Father spoke over Jesus, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And I think it's important here again to mention that this is still about God's mercy. In view of God's mercy, be holy. We believe and then we behave as Christians. We do not behave, then believe. And that's super important to keep in mind. It prevents any idea of legalism. We are not saved because we keep the law. We are saved so we choose to keep the law to honour our Father in heaven because we love him. And it should change when we keep God's mercy in mind in reference to this holiness, it changes the way we judge those in and out of the church. For those in the church, we strive to keep them accountable by reminding them of what God has done for them and challenge them to live lives more in keeping with God's holiness. Not because it's not because we want them to be saved in a sense, but because that actually that they may honour their father. It is a relationship between them and the father and they have to honour their father in heaven. And those outside of the church, we have to be careful not to judge because they are not living with God's mercy. They are not in relationship with their father in heaven. We choose holiness because we know our father they do not know their creator paul even says what business of mine is it to judge those outside of the church in 1 corinthians 5 and that's why paul actually goes on to say in this passage in romans do not conform to the pattern of this world you have been saved you should be holy this doesn't mean the world gets a free pass. Scripture is very clear that we will each be held accountable before God. Hebrews 9.27, for example, says, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Every person in the world will have to face the throne, will face judgment. But we as Christians, because of God's mercy, we have to act different. We have to behave differently. And this is difficult. It means when we look across the world, we will see things that we think look fun, that look exciting and good, and sometimes even look like they're the right action. But actually as Christians, we're supposed to be wholly in line with what God thinks and not the world. And this will mean limiting ourselves. This will mean limiting what our, the world might even say are our fundamental rights. For example, the world teaches that if you're over 18, you can drink as much as you want. But the Bible encourages us to maintain a sober mind. And so although it looks fun to do as the world does and drink as society allows us to, we need to ensure that we, in, we are acting holy in how much we drink. The world tells us we can say what we want. You know, in the West, we've been given this gift of freedom of speech. We can use it however we like. But when we read the Bible, the Bible doesn't teach that. We look at the book of James and it tells us to tame our tongue. Our language has to be holy, even when the world isn't. The Bible doesn't teach freedom of speech the bible teaches glorify god with your language the world tells us it's our body we can do with it what we want but the bible teaches celibacy until marriage 
And then when you are married, your body belongs to your spouse. Our bodies should reflect the holiness of God, not the behavior of the world. And this is challenging. This is hard. And you know what? We will fail. But Christ says in Luke, and he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever told you Christian living was easy, they were lying to you. This is not easy. This is a tough call. And we will fail in it. But yet, as Paul reminds us, we have God's mercy in view. God brings us up again and then we can strive again for holiness. And as we fall again, as we strive, God picks us up again and we keep trying we keep aiming for holiness because that's what we're called to do as christians a holiness that is described as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to god a way of life that does not conform to this world but answers the call of being a christian we will struggle in this and yet god is working in us he is transforming us Now, a little bit of theology for you, because, you know, I've paid nine grand a year. Might as well use some of it. Um, Theologians often talk about the writings of Paul, and they either say he emphasizes something called a cruciform ministry or a resurrection ministry. So a cruciform ministry is one that preaches the crucifixion. We need to be crucified with Christ. We need to emulate his crucifixion. We need to bear the death of Christ in our lives. Or they say Paul emphasized a more resurrection ministry. We need to be raised with Christ. We need to live in our new bodies. We need to be holy because we have been resurrected. But actually with most of these things, as I have found out, it's somewhere in the middle. Paul actually argues and believes in a transformational ministry that includes both crucifixion and resurrection. And we see this in Romans, that we are being transformed. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. If we allow it, the Holy Spirit can transform us. If we allow him, the Holy Spirit can transform us and wants to change our very being. In Corinthians, it says we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This should blow our minds. We are being transformed once again to be the children of God. John 1, 12, yet to all those who believed, he gave the right to become children of God. We are being transformed once again to reflect the image and likeness of God. I love this quote from an early church writer by the name of Cyril. He says this, he says, and he put on the form of a servant, although he was by nature, Lord and son, that he might transfer what was servile by nature to the glory of adopted sonship, according to his own likeness and with regard to him. On the one hand, he accepts what belongs to us, taking it to himself as his own. And on the other, he gives us in exchange what belongs to him you might not fully know what that means but what Cyril is saying is that actually we are transferred from our lowly place of brokenness of despair of being lost to adopted sonship or adopted daughtership God brings us into the divine family Jesus takes with one hand all of our rubbish all of our mess all of our baggage He takes that to himself, deals with it himself, and gives us adoption. He takes all the mess that you have and trades you adoption. From Jesus' perspective, this is a really rubbish trade. I mean, he is taking all of our brokenness and giving us adoption and he does it because he loves us he does it because he's willing because 
he puts on the form of a servant, although he was by nature Lord and Son, that he might transfer us to the glory of adoption. This is the Christian message. We are adopted into the family of God. And Paul is arguing here for a transformation that means not just with crucifixion, not just with resurrection, but both that we might be transformed to reflect our father in heaven. That we might be transformed so that we might know his will. And so as we keep God's mercy in view, as we choose holiness we quickly realize that the whole time god has actually been working on us god has been transforming us into his image and likeness so that we might know his will he has taken us from where we were lost and broken and restores a relationship changing us so that we we might be called children of god again and so that we might reflect Christ that we might be able to call on our father in heaven and so church this morning keep God's mercy in view choose holiness but ultimately allow yourself to be transformed by the Holy Spirit God is wanting to make you more to reflect his image and likeness he's wanting to make us into children again and, you know, we often say to children, don't we? We think it's a compliment. Oh, you look like your, your mum or your dad. How amazing would it be if people looked at Mulbarton Church and they said, do you know what? They reflect their father. They look like their father in heaven. And as Roman tells us, we do this by keeping God's mercy in view by choosing to be a living sacrifice and allowing God to transform us so that we might know his will. Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know the master's will. Jesus calls us friend. Paul is trying to invite us into divine adoption. It's a friendship with God in which we can know the creator's will. We can be transformed. And so my challenge for you this week is to meditate on the mercy of God. Contemplate all that God has done for you. Choose holiness. Act as a living sacrifice. And when you fall, remind yourself of God's mercy. And finally, ask yourself where you want to reflect the image of God more. Ask God to transform you so you might reflect him more in those places. Father God, I pray that as we go out this week, we will reflect you more. That people will look at us and think, wow, they really look like their father in heaven. Lord, I pray that we might celebrate in that gift of divine adoption. Lord, I pray that we will choose holiness. We will choose to be living sacrifices that we will not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead our lives will be pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray in this, as we make those choices, that we will keep your mercy in view always, that that will be our motivator for all of this, is that all that Christ has done through his life, death and resurrection, we have been saved through that and we will rejoice in that. We're now going to um, listen to a, a worship song. And if you know it, feel free to join in. But also just just listen to the words, listen um, and reflect on what God might be trying to say to you this morning. I choose to worship, I 
ti siga Though there's pain in the offering I lay you down Here in the conflict When doubt surrounds Though my soul is unraveling I choose you now Let us pray. Almighty God, in view of your great mercy, we lay our lives down as a sacrifice for you, choosing to die to self. 
we ask you to pour your mighty resurrection power through us. That Jesus may be revealed and your kingdom come in power, changing us and redeeming the world. Almighty God, help us to worship you in spirit and truth, not just with songs, but with our lives and the way we live them giving ourselves first to you and then to others. Thank you that you are transforming us into Jesus' likeness. Help us to allow you to do this and also partner with you in that transforming by, the way we f by what we feed our minds with. Thank you that you have given each one of us gifts Help us to use them to build one another up in you. May we always be motivated to use them in love. Your word reminds us that we have the mind of Christ so that we can know your will in the situations we find ourselves. We pray that we would know your will and guidance more and more, both individually and corporately. We pray that you would guide individual churches and denominations as to how to help people struggling with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and with the way forward. Almighty God, we pray for the governments around the world to act wisely in managing the, this pandemic. We especially pray for our own government to be wise in their response to this pandemic, to ensure that their actions help the poor, refugees and asylum seekers, and that they work for the common good of all. We pray for those struggling financially, that they would find ways to make ends meet. For those that have lost jobs, that they would find employment again. We pray for students who have got their A-level, GCSE or BTEC results, that they would get appropriate advice to help them to know what to do next. Almighty God, we pray for those who are sick or bereaved and those that are supporting and caring for them during this difficult time. We ask that they would know your comfort. We pray for those we know that are recovering from operations, for Morris and Rita. We pray for Adrian, that he would know your healing touch, that as a family you would be close to each one of them, supporting them during this time. Almighty God, have mercy on our land. Revive your church. Send your Holy Spirit for the sake of the lost, the least, and the broken. May your kingdom come to our nation. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as the Saviour taught us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Patrick and Sam, for your contributions this morning. Really appreciated the challenging words Sam brought to us. My... Uh, our grandfather clock has just struck 11, but I believe we've started late. So we are going to finish the service with the last couple of things. We're going to sing together, take my life and let it be, and then just read together a blessing. So let's uh, make this our prayer this morning. Take my life and let it be.
Let us pray for God's blessings upon us as we go from this place to take Jesus' good news to all. Together we say, May we be people of joy. May we be people of confidence. May we be people of courage, ready to bring others to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hope you found it helpful.